Um, well, I'd just like to say thank you very much for having me here and uh, to take the time out to, to come and listen to, to what I've got to say uh, in the next, uh, what, three hours? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll try to be as brief as I can. Okay. Um, right. Um, I, I'm here as a, as, as a visitor to, 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 to Magic, and uh, Vicky has been quite instrumental in putting together the uh, fellowship on which I'm on, uh, which is uh, funded through the uh, Peter Wall Institute of um, Advanced Studies at the, uh, uh, on, on campus out here. Uh, so I have another talk uh, next week, the week March after. 12th. Yeah, March 12th, yes. Uh, and another talk, and another talk. And <laughs> <laughs> right, so uh, I'd like to thank um, uh, Vicky for making all this possible and arranging and, and, and so on, and as well as the, uh, uh, the, the Peter Wall Institute. Right. Um, my talk today is, 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 is about making things visible. Uh, what you can't see, you can't touch, you can't avoid, you can't get into, and you can't figure out. So if you can see what you can, what's in front of you, um, the processes, or your shoelaces under the table, uh, you should be able to, to, to tie them uh, uh, properly. But if you can't see them, no feedback, um, and you have got no idea where they are, it's going to be quite tricky using a pair of mechanical arms or, or chopsticks uh, to tie your shoelaces, right? So, so based on that same, based on that basic concept of trying to make things visible, uh, is, is how do we see, how do we want to see the world from my perspective? Okay, before I start proper, I guess it's only uh, fair for me to, to do the uh, necessary stuff. Um, some greetings from where I'm from. Um, that's uh, Middlesex University's uh, library back in, in London, and note the blue skies. <laughs> Right, and another picture from the, uh, of the campus, again, blue skies. <laughs> uh, not so much blue skies here, but one, one of our other buildings in, in campus. Now, for those of you who are familiar with London, <laughs> uh, we are about there, and that, this, that, that's King's Cross, and that's Oxford Circus. So we are approximately about 25 minutes north of uh, the centre of London. Uh, not too difficult to get to if you're visiting, uh, do let me know. This is my uh, group of people, not, not everyone, uh, but the team that submitted the uh, um, uh, uh, submission to the uh, IEEE VAST Visual Analytics and Science and Technology competition last year, for which we, we won a, a prize in the uh, subject matter experts area. Uh, so that's, that's part of the group that, that, that's working with us. And when they're not on duty, uh, uh, we're down by the local park, the Greyhound. Okay, uh, very, very quickly, and uh, I think my time is running. Um, I, just a quick review of uh, the research uh, that we do. Um, Human-computer interaction, for those of you who are familiar with it, deals with, um, uh, in the most uh, visible areas, is about usability. But there's a lot more than that than, 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 than usability. We talk about uh, designing systems, representation, representing processes. We talk about decision-making that goes on and how do you support them. We talk about how do you be, create systems that help you become situationally aware of the processes that you control. Uh, we talk about the uh, engineering that goes in and the understanding of how humans think and work. Uh, we talk about collaboration. We talk about teamwork. Uh, we talk about simulation, how you train people in, in, in those kinds of domains. That's a lot of the material that we, we, we need to cover in, in the HCI kind of area in order for us to, to do what we do. Now, we've done all of these kinds of things in, in, in various domains. Uh, oh, right, uh, that, that's, that's an old Macintosh OS um, uh, logo. And I found it very nice because it deals with this notion of humans interacting with technology in such a seamless manner. You know, it, it fits together. And, and that's what we're on about in, in HCI. How do you de design innovations that fit technology with humans nicely? Now, we at the IDC, the Interaction Design Center, have a tradition in, in studying users in context, uh, primarily because you know, what we're looking for is how do you improve decision-making and coordination, uh, safety, uh, understanding what is the demands of the job so that you can create systems that support that kind of areas, uh, and therefore understanding and supporting the task and the expertise that is needed. Um, and, and of course, how do you develop uh, innovative solutions? rather than just simply automating what is currently done or what is currently badly done, all right? And in the back picture is, 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 is one such domain, air traffic control systems, the ACC, the Area Control Center in the uh, Ciampino Airport in Rome, in which we had done some work. 
And one of the pieces of work that we were funded to do in those days, this is back in 2006, 2007, is to create novel interfaces for use in the year 2025 and beyond by the air traffic controllers in a program called the um, uh, Single European Skies Air Traffic uh, uh, Research Program, CESAR. Uh, and one of the things that we, we sort of played around with is, is the notion of uh, if I can reach into the uh, displays, grab a piece of the airspace, okay, and bring it out and give it to the next guy and say, look, hand over here. Here's all the aircraft I want you to take over from me. Uh, go, go to it. So making these things more tangible and physical. So we played around with some of these ideas then in our 3D, 2D project funded by Eurocontrol. We've also worked in uh, areas of um, other domains like uh, emergency ambulance controls. Here's a control center that we've been doing, understanding what are the decision strategies of people working in those domains. In hydroelectricity, this is in Australia, and one of the things there's there was of concern here was the, uh, the, the, the deregulating of the uh, electricity industry um, and, and that huge repercussions on, on how you manage electricity. I mean, one cubic meter of water that's run off, which nobody's going to buy, is wasted uh, money. Uh, so, you know, you're talking about how do you create systems that, that help you manage those things. Or if you have a safety buffer, uh, that is big because you can't see where the limits of your systems are. If it's 25% of your capacity, it's 25% less revenue you can make. So, so some of those issues is how do you go about matching production through to uh, supply of, of electricity. Uh, some of our colleagues have worked in the areas of journalism, trying to understand how is it that piece together stories? How to get the information, put it together, think about these kinds of things. Uh, we've also looked at uh, low literacy users and how interfaces without dumbing down the language can help low literate users raise the level of uh, being able to find information on, on the internet, for example. And more recently, <coughs> uh, we've been involved in, 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 in the work in the intelligence domain. And I'm afraid this is one of those photographs where you, um, it's, it's been redacted totally. <laughs> So uh, it's, it's, it's a work domain. Uh, you can't see anything that goes on in it, and you're not allowed to ask questions about it. And if you, even if you, are, if you are allowed to ask questions about it, they'll tell you, and they'll tell you that you can't tell you either. Uh, so if you, if, you, if you think you've got a right answer, and you talk to them, and they tell you, yeah, that sounds interesting. Is it right? Is it wrong? Well, that's interesting. <laughs> and so you never get anywhere with, with talking to with, with the Intel folk. Uh, and that's one of the key problems working with this kind of domain where you need to have a better understanding of, of what they do in order to build systems for them. Uh, in another life, uh, which I'm running in parallel at the moment, I'm also the coordinator for uh, a European project called Crisis, where it deals with developing a 3D world um, uh, for, for training uh, emergency and uh, uh, crisis managers uh, when, let's say, in, in this case, an aircraft crashes on, the, uh, on a runway and how do they coordinate, how do they manage resources uh, in order to, to, to bring this across. So the project spans about six countries across Europe, about 37 engineers, 10 partners, 15, uh, 13 partners uh, across um, uh, the European Union. Fun, uh, but yeah. Um, I'm also the deputy coordinator for another project called Making Sense, um, funded by the EPSRC. And one of the key things here is how do we design systems to support investigative decision making uh, for uh, people in the, uh, the Lugas, as you call it, over in North America, uh, large unmentionable government agencies. Yeah. Another FLA, yeah. four letter acronyms, yes. So we, we, we have a partnership across um, uh, the UK um, looking at text analytics, uh, data mining, uh, graphics, uh, software engineering, creating an architecture that then brings all of these together uh, so that people can then do visualization and, and testing out the different pieces of software. <coughs> um, what, one of my other pets as well is this thing called the UK VAC, the UK Visual Analytics Consortium. Some of you may be familiar with it. The, the UK VAC is a, um, a, a grouping of five institutions, Imperial College, Bangor, University, Oxford, UCL, and us, uh, where our remit is, is to look at uh, uh, or understanding the, the, pros, the problems presented by the intelligence community and the security services community in order to find visual analytic solutions for them. 
Okay? Uh, and we are funded by the Homeland, Department of Homeland Security, ANVAC, uh, and Her Majesty's Government, uh, the Home Office and the MOD. Now, our program here uh, deals with um, two surrogate problems. We, we realize the difficulties of trying to get access to that black photograph I showed you just now. Yeah. Uh, so we've, we've got two things. Um, predicting the next Nobel laureates, for example. How do you go about suggesting they're going to be it? Um, and, and, and you can look at it from the, the, the perils in, in the, um, the security and defense domains. As well as the fight data kind of problem where you've got large volumes of data and how do you go about mining and um, uh, tracking patterns. But more importantly, how do you find little bits of behaviors that suggest something else might be happening, what we call signatures uh, in, in the data. So if Joe and, and, and Tony comes together one defined day and then the, all of a sudden you find a, a significant increase in financial transactions, uh, and then something else happens down the track. Can you predict that something else is going to happen? Um, so, so some of the, the, the challenges that we are facing is, is, is in these kinds of domains. Uh, and, and then um, uh, a plug here for the Visual Analytics Summer School. Now we are running as part of the UK VAC and together with CANVAC uh, a, a joint um, um, Visual Analytics Summer School. Uh, so CANVAC is running one in Dalhousie and we're running it in London. Same week, same time, and we plan to share speakers via teleconference or video conference uh, during that period of time as well. So if you're free during this period and you are keen on wanting to know more about visual analytics in a one short week, uh, do join us either at Dalhousie or uh, in London. Okay? So these are the people who were here at the last 2012 uh, visual analytics uh, uh, um, uh, summer school. Um, you are not in that photograph. <laughs> Yes. You got cut off. <laughs> yeah, I was looking for you. Where are you in the photograph? Yeah. So, yes, okay. So, so, you know who the people are. All right. Time is running quickly. I'm going to come now to the intelligence analysis problem. Um, I have, we have needed to, to sort of um, uh, uh, put some boundaries around it. And the problems that we're dealing with uh, are, are very two, two very simple questions. What do we need to represent in intelligence domain? If you know what you need to represent, then you can find ways of representing them. The problem is half the time we have no idea what is it that needs to be represented. So studying that kind of problem is, is, is part of the, uh, the process. It is not just simply designing visualizations and graphics. And I think sometimes that, that can, can lead us down as technologists uh, to find a hammer for the nails and everything becomes a nail and uh, that, that becomes a problem for, 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 for us as well. So what do we represent, understanding what it is, and then trying to find the visual forms to create it. So this is what we'll be looking at today. But first of all, there's a question of <clears throat> what is intelligence? And there's, there's many definitions of it. Um, one of them deals with the, uh, the notion of a product. It is the information that's produced that tells you that I can make some decisions out of it. They call it actionable uh, intelligence. And then there's a process that goes behind it. So if you're talking about it, um, uh, what do you call it, a large intelligence and environments, you have systems that uh, deal with electronic intelligence, imagery intelligence, um, photographs, and other kinds of electronic sources, as well as people who talk and tell stories to your spies. Um, so you have a whole spectrum of these things. So you need an organization to be able to collect, collate, process these kinds of information um, and the organization to support it. Without that, you're not going to get the kinds of intel that you require in order to allow the commander to make decisions about things. Uh, primarily, it's an intellectual process. The question is, what is it? Okay? So, um, some, some people, in, 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 for example, in Interpol, uh, talk about it as the identification and provision of insight. Really nice word. Uh, into the relationship between data and other potentially relevant data. Uh, so, in other words, give me an understanding, give me an explanation of what's going on so that I can act on it, right? Um, and people also talk very clearly. It is not just purely reorganizing data in the different format. That's, that's of no value to the intelligence community. Um, in, in stories from the um, uh, um, uh, Bletchley Park, uh, somebody who used to be an intelligence analysis, an analyst in, the, in Bletchley Park, 
for those of you who are not familiar with Bletchley Park, it is the place where, um, in the UK, where in the Second World War, um, all the spooks came together and they sat down and they de decoded some of the transmissions that the Germans were sending out. Uh, and because they were able to break the code of transmissions, they were able to then tell the British commanders uh, what to do next. Okay, in order to anticipate. So Bletchley Park is a place in, in, in the UK, not far from London. Right, so he talks about it in this way, in his experience at that time. Reviewing known facts, sorting out significant from the insignificant, assessing them severally, jointly, arriving at conclusions by the exercise of judgment. Part induction, part deduction. And at the same time, I believe, according to Moore, it's a part abduction. So there's a whole process of inference making that, that's necessary. And it's not just analysis, breaking stuff apart, but it's also synthesis, trying to be able to construct an explanation that allows you to then take things forward. And in the whole process is to give you that kind of insight. Okay? Um, the full set of clue in, in a unique explanatory perspective, which is a handy way of, of, of talking about insights rather than trying to pin your finger on it. There, there's more about intelligence analysis. Okay, so you want to be able to recreate it, re repurpose the information, put it in different contexts and trying to understand it. And I'll explain that uh, later on in some of the problems that we, we face. And once you understand it, you're trying to reconstruct from very little information a meaningful story. And that reconstruction process is, 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 uh, is, is attended by all kinds of, of biases and problems. Problems because the data often is large and you've got to select some. Problems as well because it's human. What do you pick? Your biases will influence uh, the, the, the kinds of uh, strings of evidence that you pull together. And initially, we thought, based on some of the work with um, uh, our, <coughs> uh, our unmentionables, um, it isn't just search and retrieval. It's a lot more than that. So systems that just do search and retrieval and, and basic analysis uh, stops at a very limited area. But what they're trying to do is trying to connect stuff. They're trying to make sense out of things. They're trying to, to construct a meaning that allows them to, make, uh, to, to, to take things ahead. Okay? So you want systems that not just discriminate between different types of information. Um, you also deal with hard and soft data. As I said before, imagery, stories from the street. Okay? Uh, and you want to be able to know that uh, new data is coming in as well and how those new data is influencing your conclusions that you have made previously so that you don't make mistakes or so you are able to be aware of them. Uh, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is to be able to create a system that helps the data tell the story, enabling users to create representations of their own that helps them externalize their thinking about what the, 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 uh, the story is about. Uh, and I'll talk more about this later on. Okay, we'll leave that for the moment and then we go into the, 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 the area of complex systems where the cognitive systems engineering people sort of uh, reside. Uh, very much a, an area from um, uh, process control. Um, it, uh, CSE, or cognitive systems engineering, started life um, in, in Denmark uh, in trying to understand the nature of um, um, designing systems for nuclear power plants in those days back in the 50s. Um, of course, uh, Denmark has gone uh, non-nuclear uh, since, since then. Um, however, the, the same principles have been taken across to, to a variety of different places, understanding the processes that, that, that link, uh, the functional relationships that link different processes in, 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 in the system. And so that you can understand, like, if I were to tweak this particular valve, how it influences, um, uh, let's say, temperature, pressure, how that temperature, pressure eventually influences higher order goals such as um, uh, system limits and its safety, and how it influences other issues such as uh, uh, market forces acting on, on, on the production of those things. Okay, and this particular method uh, has been documented uh, and it has a number of different uh, uh, sub-actions, right, sub-processes. Sub a work domain analysis that helps you dissect what the problem is the control task analysis, what do people do in terms of making decisions? The strategy analysis, the, the ways in which, in which they make these kinds of decisions. The social organization needed support that the kind of decision making process in, in, in collaboration and the kinds of worker com competencies that are necessary, their expertise, their training, 
that is required to bring them to the level of performance in order to carry out those jobs. What you end, you end up doing is, is trying to find ways of linking and showing these structures that permeate through the processes. Okay? And then the ultimate goal is to create visibility that, of these underlying processes and the data and how they work together. <clears throat> now, this is not a very good picture, unfortunately. It is a, um, it's a mimic diagram, a PID or whatever you want to call it, a process indicator kind of diagram. It's a physical representation. It just shows you one dimension of the system, the physical uh, connectivities. <coughs> Very hard to, to understand how does that connect up with uh, uh, the markets. Can't tell, right? Whereas other kinds of um, uh, systems, that this, this has been designed by, the, uh, I, I believe, the Japanese um, atomic energy agencies, one of the experimental systems, uh, where they tie different types of data together um, configurable displays that bring multiple sets of information together that shows you connections with limits as well as, 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 uh, as plant performance. Um, this is one of the more common ones that we see in the area of ecological interface design uh, where Kim Vicente and his, his, his was, was playing a lot with in this particular thing where we talk about uh, different plant facilities, heat, temperature, settings, and volume and pressure, and how they relate to uh, uh, to, the, to the overall performance of the system, bearing in mind time lags uh, and, 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 and other kinds of issues. Okay, uh, and these are other ways in which those kinds of um, uh, cognitive systems engineers have come up with different types of designs that allows you to see time, for example, how a system behaves over time in terms of multiple dimensions. Um, I'm going very very quickly uh, across this. But the idea here is, is it still comes down to, to the issue. Is it, how do we structure the relationships that underlie data and, and the evidence that support the descriptions of what is observed? How do we do that, right? So in, it, <clears throat> so in, in, in the process of, of looking at that question, one of the things that came to mind uh, as we started studying this is that in engineered systems, you do have um, a priori structures. Because it's a design system, I know what's there. I know what the pipings are, and I know what laws govern uh, the way the pipes and processes work. If it's a, um, uh, let's say, a heat uh, uh, energy system, there are laws of thermodynamics, for example, that govern these behaviors. So you can say these behaviors are then matched across uh, to, to these things. But in the intelligence analysis environment, we don't have such a priori structures. The structures are logical. They're up here. And we construct them, or the analyst constructs them on the fly. They don't have the same kind of, we don't have the same kind of uh, mechanism of designing a priori. So what you have to do here is, is a different design approach. You've got to think about design from the perspective of um, uh, constructing the means by which these analysts can construct these structures on the fly, rather than thinking of designing it about constructing the designs um, uh, beforehand. So that's something that we found quite, quite interesting as we are starting to work with this. And as we start to work with, with Vicky on the area of financial uh, systemic risk analysis as well, we're starting to see the same problems. Uh, we don't have an a priori structure from which we can then represent. We need to be able to create these things, uh, or, or, or the analysts, allow the analysts to create these things on, on the fly. So tools are needed, which is uh, different. Yeah. Now, in the CSE world as well, there's a... <coughs> I'll come down to the design bits in a short while. Uh, there, there's something called, the, uh, it's, a, it's a very nice model that was done by Tim Vicente and uh, one of his students uh, many years ago. This is the process that you're controlling, or you're trying to represent. The different aspects, it's functional purpose, it's abstract function, it's general function, and it's physical form. And how do they send information across to the different types of interfaces which you need to be able to see things with and the interfaces from which you then act upon, the controls of the interfaces. And up here is the, um, the, the human side of things, uh, you, where you look at um, uh, recognizing patterns and you look at recognizing rules and how certain kinds of information uh, that, that govern your behavior based on those, those rules. And then if there are new events, for example, way up there you're talking about you know, knowledge-based behaviors and how do I reason to be able to deal with a new problem that I've not seen before, uh, for example. Now, 
Using this as a framework, I thought it was quite handy. It tells us a number of things, or it raises a few questions that we need to look at. Uh, it tells us what is it that we need to model and what is it that we need to represent okay? of the system, whatever the system may be. In our case, intelligence, the human analytical in intellectual processes. What visual form should it take? And then what decisions are re relevant that needs to be made in that particular context? And we start to see, look, in, in terms of the decision making, there's a number of different models or different types of uh, a variety of decision making processes that come into place. I don't have time to go through all of them, but suffice to say that there's some that deals with uh, recognition of patterns, some that deals with the sense making, some deals with the investigative processes, some deal with just simply being aware of what's going on. Because if you're not aware of what's going on, you cannot possibly take into this, uh, con the, the context of the situation into, into its consideration. Uh, what should you represent? Well, in CSE, we talk about something called uh, showing the space of uh, uh, possibilities. And, and that's quite important in a particular domain because if you have restricted yourself to a particular set of tools only, then what's going to happen is that the analyst will ca can and will only use those sets of tools at the detriment of possible other kinds of data that exist that those tools are not uh, able to work with. Right? You want to review relationships and not just fix trajectories through the things. Fixed trajectories suggest things that happens all the time, routine, regularity. What to model? Very important are the functional relationships that link performance across the different levels of abstraction. Okay, let's take a look first at the, uh, the, the decision levels. <clears throat> Some of you may be familiar with this model, well overused, the Card and Pirolli model of the intelligence uh, an analysis process, where they suggest that there is a, a foraging loop where I'm looking for information and I'm, I'm putting them together in a, in a cardboard box, for example, shoe boxing, uh, and just sorting and organizing data, searching and sorting and organizing data. And then once you've gone past a sta stage, you, you talk about a, a hypothesis loop where you start to make suggestions about what those data that you've collected means. And in that particular process, uh, then you start finding information to support your hypothesis about where things are and what things are supposed to mean. Um, unfortunately, a lot of this thing up here is, is crucial, but we don't have very much support in this particular description. However, down here is very good in terms of being able to explain what goes on and therefore how we support it. And with a lot of intelligence uh, and in visual analytics systems, they tend to work very much down at this end. Okay? Uh, and what we're saying is that we need something else to help us understand what goes on up here. Then this model doesn't provide us with uh, adequate answers to, to that. So we started looking elsewhere and we found something called the, um, uh, uh, the, the data frame model by Gary Klein. And one of his ideas here is it's very simple. Okay, when you try to understand what's going on in the environment, right? Um, uh, I, I'm trying to connect with what the data is about. Okay, um, uh, if I can see it, I can start to understand what it means. Ah, it gives me an understanding. That ah moment is, is, is when you connect with the data. And when you have understood what that connection means, you can then say, what else is there about this new situation that I've discovered that is important to me? And that's an elaboration process. You start thinking about elaborating it and asking questions about it, saying, look, what other information is there that tells me about the situation that happened on the 9-11, right, for example. And once you have fully understood what happened, that certain airplanes crashed into the environment and, uh, and, and what else happened, then you start saying, look, is it possible that they, could, they did this deliberately? That's a questioning process. So you're starting to question your assumptions about what these go, what, what, why the story that you have created, um, uh, is it valid in the first place? And then maybe you say, no, nah, this can't be, this can't be an accident. It's just too deliberate. So it becomes a reframing of your understanding, so it allows you to do that, uh, to think about reframing it. So this model we thought was very handy because these are the kinds of processes that an analyst, regardless of where you are, or even a PhD student trying to do the literature review, will have to go through. And we found this as, as a nicer way of explaining what goes on at the hypothesis making levels uh, than, than the Pirolli and Cart model. And then as we, we got into this a little bit further, we started to find that what's crucial actually is that the intelligence analysis is not just the sense making process. 
it is actually a, a combination of a number of different types of ways of thinking. Okay? We briefly spoke about this already, Gary Klein's work on uh, sense-making model, the uh, data frame model. And then there's a lot of work on, on, on causal reasoning. You know, how do we understand what causes what in a particular place, and what are the rules by which it governs these kinds of behaviors? Causal, causal, uh, is, it, is it causal, is it called relational? Uh, and then you need to think about other issues like counterfactual reasoning. For example, what if these things don't exist? How would it happen if I remove a, a piece of data from the thing? Okay? And then this whole issue of inference making. And what we are finding here is that often we are taught that the inferences, we've got induction, deduction, abduction processes. And we often look at it as, as, as fairly separate processes and we tend to therefore design systems that support these fairly separate processes. And what we're seeing often now, uh, anecdotally at the moment, but we're hoping to be able to collect more data eventually, is that these things are very tightly intermingled. Very often I get one piece of data, uh, a piece of clay, right? Now, why is this piece of clay important? A triangular piece of clay, a broken piece of clay. Um, ah, if I'm an archaeologist, Roman settlements. Ah, okay, maybe Roman settlements. Then what kinds of rules govern these Roman settlements? There are certain ways in which you interpret these things. So you build up that particular rule and you move from abduction into other kinds of inductive processes where you then reinforce your rules to say, ah, I've got more evidence to suggest that rules actually work. And then your conclusions become stronger. And as you say, with stronger conclusions, you can then say that I have a better picture which I now know I need to find more evidence to be able to test that hypothesis. So this process goes up and down, in and out, uh, rather than one after the other. And trying to design systems that allow you to do that is, is quite demanding. And how do you go about doing that? Okay, so that's one of the areas. Uh, and then what we're finding is that there's this other side to it. The explanation, the, um, the sense-making frame part of it falls down into the explanation. Now, we, we, we also study uh, uh, narratives. We also study uh, the, the, the issue of arguments and logic. Now, a lot of the time, we, we tend, again, as separate entities. What we are finding is that this is a continuum in, in the explanation world of intelligence analysis. You may start off with a very light possibility. Here's a story. How it's, it may be plausible. It may not be plausible. You know? And then we, when we find more evidence and we find our inferences are stronger, it could become a narrative, a stronger way of telling it. And then eventually, when we get enough evidence to tie everything together, we need to then create an argument that would withstand uh, rigorous interrogation in, let's say, a court of law. Right? So you see a, a continuum rather than just purely separate elements in, in the process. Now, all this is quite crucial because once you start thinking about it, you need to have a framework to design these kinds of things, uh, these kinds of intelligence analysis. The, uh, the, the, the analyst requires a space whereby he can see what's in his data. If I can't see what's in the data, I can't interrogate it. If I don't know what the variables are, I can't ask questions about it. Yeah? And then you need a space to do the analysis. Now, a lot of the VA tools and, uh, that we have today support these areas very nicely, the data space and the analysis space. What we do need now um, is, is the next generation of tools that help us to understand how to create the hypotheses, to be able to say, what are the stories that I need to test? And how do I bring my evidence together? How do I construct my chains of evidence that allows me to then uh, tell a possible, possible story? And some of those things is what we call uh, conclusion pathways. <coughs> the visual form. <coughs> I'm going to skip through this very quickly because um, yeah, this is just running out of, out of time. Um, and, and the notion of ecological uh, perception. Um, this is a view from my old office in, uh, in New Zealand. Uh, from here, if I were to think about how to get across over there, um, you can find a number of ways by just simply viewing it, right? You can find solution pathways across. You can either take the road down and then maybe, if this, since there's a water, water area over here, you can take a boat across, right? Uh, you, you, can, you can dream up the, the, the possible ways of dealing with it. Um, so what we're trying to do is to be able to use these visual affordances and apply this concept of visual affordances in the creation, in, into the, the data areas in order to create methods whereby we can then design 
I'm going to skip through a lot of this. I don't think I've got time to give you any physics demo as well. It's just uh, not enough time. So I'm just going to go through very quickly some of the other issues. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> in the process of doing that, we discovered there's at least 20 representation design problems, of which I'm going to talk about three this afternoon. Okay. Seeing large data sets, reasoning space through a small keyhole, or we call the keyhole problem. Um, how do you deal with missing data, which we call the black hole problem? And how do you deal with misleading or, or deceptive data, uh, the, we call the brown worm problem? Okay, so let's take a look. Keyhole problem. Very often, this is what the analysts face. All right, they have lots of data coming through the various kinds of systems: Intel, Elint, open sources, whatever you. Uh, and then they have it's like a jigsaw puzzle on the table, right? Um, take the jigsaw puzzle out, a thousand pieces, pop it over on the tabletop. Um, problem. You now have the keyhole of your computer display, and you're trying to piece them together. New problem. The nasty guy has taken the box top off and thrown it away. So you've got no context, and you're trying to piece it together. More problem. You don't have one jigsaw. You have multiple jigsaws sitting on that table at the same time and trying to decide which one belongs to which particular one. That's a problem. And you're trying to do that through some kind of a, a, a keyhole structure. So all kinds of biases come into place. All kinds of problems with the information summarization, representation come, come into play. Okay? So this is one area that we need to be able to deal with. So it's like taking a look at the, the, this photograph. This, this is a picture of Prague Castle. Right? Um, we can akin that to a, a data set uh, that we often work with. From here, what's inside the castle? Very hard to tell. If we had a map of it, maybe we can be able to do that. So if we had a map, we straight away we'd be able to know where we can go directly to find stuff that we're looking for. So in the same way, um, I think some of you have used Inspire. That's what they've done. They've created uh, a visual representation for, for these kinds of things. Very handy. And there are various ways in which you can do that. So things like tree maps and whatever are also techniques that allows you to see what's in the data and how they're structured. Moving quickly along, what do you see? <coughs> Some of you have seen this? Yeah. Right. Does anybody else see a dog? Yeah. Yeah, good. OK. That, that's, that's, how, that's how amazing our ability is to see patterns uh, in, in, in these things are. Can you see, can you see the dog? Yeah, okay. You can't see the dog? Look harder. <laughs> uh, well, what, 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 what we're trying to do is that this, this is some of the, the, the stuff which uh, I think Colin is probably, um, uh, you know, deals with in his sleep. Uh, he doesn't have to, to talk about it in a, in a very conscious way. Um, it goes back to some of the work in, in pre-attentive processing uh, areas. Uh, we can pick up patterns very quickly. Um, and understand what those differences are uh, very quickly. Oh, in case you still haven't seen the dog, there's a dog. Can you see it? No? <laughs> okay, but once you learn to see it, you, you always see it, and you cannot not see it any longer. Okay, anyhow, the idea here is that we want to make use of some of these concepts in order to design the representations. Very, very quick example. Uh, of, of a concept called emergent features. <clears throat> Four bars telling me the performance of my aeroplane's engines. They're all doing well, right? It creates an emergent feature of a horizontal line at the very top. Everything's fine. It's very easy to see if something uh, is, is failing. Which engine, if it's number one, two, three, and four? One, two, three, and four. Okay? Which one's failing or not doing well? Straight away. No thinking about it. Now, if we can make use of the same concepts in how we go about talking about data, for example, missing data, <clears throat> then you'll help us understand it. Okay? Now, very often, we are presented with data. Um, when, 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 what, what do we do with missing data? We very often summarize it or average it off, stick an average number into it, and there you go. Is any missing data in there? Can't tell. Yep. But if we did this, okay, Straight away, we know where the missing data lies. Now, what I've called black holes allows you to pinpoint where those missing data lies. For the Intel analysts, 
For some of us, this is obvious. But for the Intel analysts, they need to know this so that they can ask, why did that whole series of communications not occur? They've been talking to each other for a long time, then all of a sudden, blank. Now, is it because our systems did not pick it up? Is it because um, you know, uh, they deliberately did not say anything because they're about to mount something? It allows you to ask questions. So what we're trying to do here is that making the data representations visible so that you can ask questions about them. Okay, so this allows you to ask questions about it. Okay, <clears throat> but if you fill it up again with averages, like I said, you, you can't tell, you can't make, make guesses about what, what goes on. And in terms of the brown hole, here we're talking about how do you construct lines of evidence so that you, using these kinds of lines of evidence, you can then, uh, chains of evidence that you can then construct an argument based on it, all right? And we make use of concepts from Stephen Toulmin's uh, 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 logic of arguments, for example, theory of arguments, uh, in order to give us some idea of how you construct these things together. But for example, you may have a claim to make, you have some data on which you can make those claims, right? And these claims and, 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 and grounds of data are, are, are connected by some kind of a rule, uh, a warrant, that allows you to associate these kinds of things together. Okay? Now, each of these grounds or data that evidence that you have is possibly supported by a number of different types of data that is brought together in order to allow you to make that claim. Uh, and under certain rules, these things work, and under certain rules, these things don't work. Okay? And then you can construct chains of this kind of evidence to, to help you uh, support your particular claim. Okay? However, there may be poor sources that feed into the system, or there may be conclusions that are somebody else's conclusions that are feeding into the process, or there are conclusions based on somebody else's conclusions that are feeding into the process. How do you deal with them? It doesn't tell you now that there are poor links in the data chains. But if you have methods whereby you can simply do this and say, look, show me where the poor quality data are, then you can do something else. You can start asking yourself, look, what happens if <coughs> those, poor quality, those poor quality data are not available? Or, or, or let's say, let's remove them. Do we still have the same uh, conclusions? Does it make a difference? This is the notion of counterfactual reasoning. So you start supporting different ways of, of, of thinking about these things by simply having very simple rules about how you use visual forms not visualization, visual forms uh, of presenting the data to the end users. And this allows them to question, think about the data in a different way rather than being told that here's the answer that the computer had, had solved for you. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do in terms of the, the, the Intel analysts, supporting that intellectual reasoning process rather than trying to provide answers in a visual manner but making use of visualizations to help them query what is it that they are seeing. Okay? So in conclusion, um, we need to be able to uh, create uh, supports that allows people to explore under uncertainty, reveal the nature of the data, what's in it, because if I don't know what's in it, I can't ask questions about it. Uh, what is the structures in those data sets, relationships between them, and very importantly, how do we allow them to construct new assemblies of evidence? Okay. Um, yeah, okay, and, 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 and primarily how do we go about orchestrating this in the context of what we call the reasoning workspace. I'm going to leave it as there, otherwise I'm uh, running out of time. Uh, if you want to see a little bit about the, the, the system that we've been working with um, to do some of these things, uh, in visit.com. Um, the, the movies up there at the moment is, is a bit dated deliberately, uh, but um, yeah, you're welcome to have a look at some of the early ideas behind it. Great. Great. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. So that's been a, a fascinating peek through the keyhole into the world of intelligence analysis and making it visible. And we do have a few minutes for questions. Um, and what I'd like to say is that uh, if, you, if you don't get to all your questions, we are going to be having um, pizza and some refreshments over in the Magic Lab, just following the presentation. So we can all troop over there.
And um, if you have questions for, for William, and maybe even an opportunity to, to take a look at things you can over there. So um, any questions for, for William now? Well, and maybe we're all just thinking and digesting. And so um, at this point, do you want to? Just, just out of curiosity, we're focusing on the result. But I was thinking more generally, the upland has a lot of power metaphor. And some metaphors are visible and some aren't, right? Like you say, oh, it's the and and or something. You know, yeah. uh, or an angry giant like that. There's forces and other things that are not that are visible. So how do you see the goal of metaphor? I'm actually using metaphors already. Yeah. I've never really given it much thought in, in, in that context. But what you do find is that these kinds of things do come into play because people talk about what something like this and how do I show data something like this. It all depends on how we construct the um, something like this. So in the, in the sense of here, you know, uh, in, in many of the current systems, we, we have text-based systems, lines after lines. <clears throat> what we have in Invisic allows us to take a line and it becomes an individual card, for example. So they are each, each, each piece of information is a, 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 that's an index card. And by organizing these index cards in different ways, it gives you a, a, me a, a mechanism of arranging your, your data. It's very much just like uh, a, a literature review process. I take all my papers, I stack them in different stacks, so it's just like my tabletop where I can organize all of the stuff about um, one topic here and all the stuff about another topic here. And then if I bring them together, supported by electronics, for example, I can do Boolean operations, I can do set operations and so on uh, by, by using that. So we're not no longer just making use of a metaphor of a desktop, but we're now using the technology to be able to support interaction in that kind of test, in that kind of desktop.